Hey guys, thanks for joining me for an episode of Learn to Play Games. My name is Lance, and today we're going to take a look at Massive Darkness. This is a new game by Simon and Guillotine Games. It is a 1-6 player, fully cooperative dungeon crawling board game that takes roughly an hour and a half to three hours to play, depending upon the scenario you've chosen. And there's two different ways to play this. You can play it as a single scenario where you sit down, you choose a scenario out of the book that you want to play, or you can create your own, or you can play it as a campaign where you're going to chain a number of scenarios together and your characters will go from scenario to scenario and you'll level them up as they go along. So there's a couple of really interesting ways of doing that. So in the game itself, each player is going to be playing a hero or heroes, which are called Lightbringers. And in the game, they're going to be going into these unexplored dungeons where they're trying to meet different goals based on the scenario you've chosen or the one you've created. And they're trying to meet these goals in order to accomplish and beat that scenario. In the, each scenario, you're going to be facing three different enemy types. Now, there's a variety of enemies within each type, but each type has its own way of functioning. So first off, you have the mobs. These are usually, they will be led by one boss that are going to be surrounded by a number of minions based on the number of heroes that are playing. These guys are usually very easy to kill and will go down fairly quickly, and most of the time, one or two heroes can pretty much handle a whole mob. Then you have your agents, which are kind of like your mini bosses. They're going to come in, you're going to, they're going to have a number more hit points, and they might be a little bit more armored and be able to hit you a little bit harder. Uh, on top of that, at the end of each round, if you don't defeat them, then they're going to be bringing out mobs to help them, help reinforce them in that. So they're ones that are, that are kind of like on a timetable. You really have to get in there and hammer them, because if they go a couple rounds, you're going to be facing a lot more enemies from them. And then finally, we have the roaming monsters. These guys are like the bosses. They have, they come out with a ton of hit points, and there's two different levels of them. You have your lesser and your greater, depending upon where you are within the scenario and what level you're at. These guys are going to have a ton of hit points. Like I said, they're also, each of these types is going to be, uh, when they come out, you, they, you will draw a treasure card with them. And if these treasure cards can be used by them, which I will explain how that works in the in the game itself, the enemies will use them against you. So it's a really terrifying thing, especially if you get an enemy that can use like a really powerful weapon or they get some really nice armor that boosts them up, makes them even harder to kill. Uh, these guys will definitely take your entire group's effort to, to bring down and usually will take a number of rounds to do so. So those are your three enemy types. Uh, a, a couple other features of this game. One is that it has a heavy focus on terrain and how... Uh, each tile is going to work is that they're broken down into sections and there are going to be some sections that are lit spaces with torches and whatnot and then there's going to be shadow spaces and in the shadow spaces the heroes are going to get boosts or uh, special abilities that they will have access to uh, only in those spaces so it's going to really play a uh, heavy role in your characters and how you run your game and how you guys work together to utilize these spaces because basically you're jumping out of the shadows to stab one of the enemies in the back and it definitely can make a big difference. Uh, certain uh, heroes uh, like the archer will get additional couple damage points and all kinds of different things. So definitely utilize those spaces as they do make a big difference in the game, especially going against some of those bigger enemies that you need every little piece of help you can get. So my opinions of this one so far are really good. I've enjoyed this. Obviously, I like Simon games. I've covered a lot of their games. And this one is being or was developed by Guillotine Games, which is obviously the creators of Zombie Side. So first off, I know a lot of you guys are going to be curious. Is this just a direct copy of Zombie Side? Is this just another Zombie Side as a dungeon crawler? No, it's not. You are, if you've played Zombie Side, I think you'll have an easier time picking this one up as, as you will notice some similarities with some of the rules, with the way some of the things work. But it is different enough that you, if you just played Zombie Side and you just say, well, I, I, you know, I'm going to just jump right in. I think I can figure this all out. No problem. You're going to be wrong. You're going to need to read the rule book or obviously hopefully watch my video and it's good enough that it'll get you through. But um, there are enough number of differences. Obviously, just alone with the tiles, the way that they work, and the way that there are light zones and shadow zones and how characters are going to use them in their shadow modes and all kinds of different things, the way that the weapons and, and that work, uh, you'll like again, you'll notice some of the same art direction, art style, where the cards are laid out similarly, 
where they're going to be familiar, but even then, some of the symbols on the bottom of the cards are different. There's three versions of combat in this, the melee, ranged, and magic, as opposed to just melee and ranged in Zombie Side. So keep that in mind as you guys jump into this, that it's, it's not another Zombie Side. There's enough differences there. From there, a couple other things that I really like. I like the enemy types. I like the different varieties. And I like the way that the roaming monsters work. They really add some tension to the game. And, uh, you know, I mean, you really do have to work at some of those guys, especially depending upon the the uh, treasure card that they get, and which is another feature that I've really enjoyed with this, as it re really does change every time you play. Obviously, you know, you don't know what you're going to draw, and sometimes, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't help the monster at all. They can't use it, which is great, and you're all happy about it. And then there's other times they're going to pick up a treasure item that's a, you know, a magical weapon that they can use or, you know, some really powerful armor. And it's just going to make your job that much harder. And then the, you know, on top of that, some of these scenarios are going to be timed or have like some limitations where you need to, to progress quickly. These guys are going to slow you down. There are tar pits that are just going to hold you and really make you guys spend every action that you can to, to utilize everything you can. So those are some really th good things that I like. There are a couple drawbacks, of course. Uh, just like any game, um, you know, it, it, it's very hard to write a rule book, especially for games like this or for a lot of the other big games. Um, and they did a really good job with it, but there are a couple areas that I would have liked a little bit more elaboration on. And a couple of things that I'm a little, I was a little unsure on, so I'm not 100% sure on if some of these things are done correctly. So if something comes up in the video that is incorrect, please let me know and I will do my best to correct it. And hopefully they'll release an FAQ that might clarify some of these things as well. Other than that, like I said, this is a game that I would recommend checking out if you guys are interested in these kind of games. Uh, if you like dungeon crawlers and you like, uh, you know, really going in there and just decimating a lot of enemies, as you will have a lot of enemies in this game. There's a lot between the mobs and the agents and the, and the roaming monsters. There's always somebody to, to, to work on cutting down and, and, you know, really making you feel like the heroes in this. So let's go ahead and head to the table and I'll teach you how to play. There are four different color dice in Massive Darkness. You have yellow, red, blue, and green. These dice are broken into two groups. You have the attack group, which are the yellow dice being the light attack and the red dice being heavy attack, and the defensive group with the blue dice being the light defense and green dice being heavy defense. Each of these dice is going to have varying symbols on it, including blank sides, swords for the attack dice, which are successful hits, and bams and diamonds. Both of these will be used based on the items you have and will be able to activate special abilities, which we're going to cover more in the items section. Moving over to the defense dice, you'll have defensive shields, which are successful defenses, and BAMs and Diamonds as well, which will activate defensive abilities that are listed either on your cards or your player boards themselves. And again, we'll cover this more later. The first set of cards we're going to look at are the treasure cards, which there are starting equipment cards and then treasure cards from levels 1 all the way to 5. And each of these decks is going to be comprised of a number of different cards, which include three different types of weapon cards, which are melee weapons, ranged weapons, and magic weapons. Also, we will have armor in there and items. Each of these cards is going to have the same type of features on it. So at the top of the card is going to be the name of that card. Then we have the level of the card. If it is a weapon, it'll show one or two hands and armor will have an armor icon on the other side. Then we will have an image of the item and, it, and underneath that is telling us what type of an item it is. So we have melee weapons, ranged weapons, magic weapons, armor, and items. Underneath that will be any special abilities that that item has and how you activate them. For example, with the scrimmage bow, when making an attack, if you roll a bam, you can spend one bam to give you one additional yellow dice. And same for the armor here. For a defensive roll, if you roll a bam, you can heal one wound on that hero. Finally, the weapons and armor are going to have four icons on the bottom. The icons are the three different weapon types and armor. So going from one side to the other, you have melee, ranged, magic, 
and armor. And each item or weapon or armor is going to highlight the areas that it can use with the gold around the edges. So for example, with the long sword, it is a melee weapon, so it can be used in melee combat and will give one yellow dice. And it also has a defensive ability that gives you one blue dice. And that is true for each item. It will highlight in gold which values it can use. So an item can never be used in the areas that it does not have highlights. The next card we're gonna look at is a Lifebringer card. During setup, you're going to place this card out along with two health tokens on it. You can also increase or decrease the difficulty of the game by adding or removing health tokens to start the game with. And this card states, at the start of a round, if there are any dead heroes, remove one health token from this card and resurrect and fully heal a dead hero. Now, if at any point in time you remove, you have to remove a token and there aren't any tokens remaining, then the game is over and the hero players have lost. Moving on, we have artifact cards, which only certain scenarios will use specific artifact cards. These are usually very powerful cards, so if you can acquire one, you definitely want to go for it. Then we have door cards. The first time you open a door to a new room, you're going to go ahead and draw a door card, and this will add treasures and different guards to that room, which we're going to go over in a little bit. Finally, we have event cards, which at the end of each round, you're going to be required to draw and resolve an event card, which normally these are going to have negative effects, such as summoning uh, roaming monsters or adding new guards to a different area. But every once in a while, there will be positive uh, effects from these cards as well. Moving over to the enemy cards, we have the five levels of guard cards, which are going to be comprised of both mobs and agents. And these cards are broken down the same way. We have the name of the enemy at the top and their level, an image of the enemy, and the type of enemy it is. So we have mobs and agents. On one side, you're going to have the number of hit points that each model in that group will have. And on the other side for mobs will be the number of minions based on the number of heroes multiplied by the number. So let's go and show an example of this. Let's go ahead and say that we drew this card so we would put out the mob boss first and then a number of minions based on the number of heroes multiplied by that number. So we're playing three heroes, so we'll have three minions surrounding that mob boss. Then we have any enchantments that that unit has and finally the types of attacks that unit can make and if they will get any defense when being attacked. So each of these will be highlighted with gold just like with the weapons if they can do it. So with Dwarf Defenders, they can make melee attacks, and they'll get to throw one yellow dice, and they will be able to defend with two blue dice. Agents work the same way. The only difference is that they will usually have a number, um, a number of hit points that will be multiplied based on the number of heroes. And they will also have a special ability, so you want to eliminate these guys quickly, because at the end of each phase, they will get to bring out new guard units to help them out. Finally, we have the roaming monsters, which are going to, there's going to be two levels of them. For levels one through three, you'll spawn lesser roaming monsters, and levels four through five, you'll spawn greater roaming monsters. And the basics of these, these are kind of like boss characters, so they're going to have a ton of hit points, a lot of abilities, and they're going to be throwing a ton more dice at you. For example, with this one, you're going to have three yellow dice for an attack and three blue dice for defense. So she's going to take a lot more to bring down. And the greater roaming monsters are even worse versions of that, throwing more attack dice and greater defense dice. The one other thing I need to cover with enemies is that roaming monsters, agents, and the bosses that lead mobs are all considered guardians. What this means is that when the players draw one of these cards, they're also going to draw a treasure card of the current level that the heroes are on and add it to that enemy. Now, if these cards are consumable items or, or just regular items, they're simply going to be equipped to the enemy. The enemy will not be able to use those cards. And when a hero kills the enemy, they will receive those cards. But if they are weapon cards or armor cards, if that enemy's highlighted stats match up with the weapon or armor, they will actually be able to use those items against the heroes, making the enemies even nastier or more defensive. So let's take a look at this. Let's go ahead and say that the goblin archers drew the fire sword. This is going to be added underneath their card, and since the fire sword is a melee weapon and the goblin archers melee attack is highlighted, they can actually use that item. And so now, now all of a sudden they're throwing one yellow dice and one red dice, making them even nastier to deal with and hitting harder against the heroes. On top of that, 
the enemies can use must use their abilities first for bams and di and uh, diamonds but if an item that they have equipped that they can actually use has abilities for bams and diamonds they can actually use any remaining ones after they've resolved any enchantments that they have first on the item that they have equipped making them nastier as well now the one other thing that to keep in mind is that let's go ahead and say for example that our rolling monster here acquired this armor there is a cap to number of dice that, a, that a enemy and heroes can throw which is three dice of the same color so with this situation, they could not throw the four blue dice. She can only throw a maximum of three dice, but she will still benefit from the item's ability down below for defense. So there's a couple of things I want to cover real quick before heading into the game. The first is line of sight. For both heroes and enemies, line of sight is in straight lines. There is no diagonal line of sight, and it will go as far as the board edges, walls, or closed doors. So let's look at a couple of examples of this. So we have Bjorn up here, so he can see straight down to this wall here, or this wall, so he can see all three of these areas. With Owen here, he can see all the way outside to this area as there's a closed door here. But let's go ahead and say that this these doors were opened. He can see all the way down to this board edge here, as enemies do not block line of sight, and all the doors are open so he can see the dwarf defenders. And likewise, they can also see him. From there, we also have the level markers. So the level markers are going to denote what the current level is that the heroes are in. So let's go ahead and say, for example, that all our heroes were in level one. So that is the current active level. Anytime an enemy is going to be spawned, it will be at that current level. The first time that a hero moves into a new tile that has a higher level, that level is going to become the active level and the older level will become inactive. And this is not going to be changed even if that hero moves back and that tile becomes empty again, it will still remain active as the current level. And this is also going to be important for the hero's skills as whatever the current highest level is that will activate the hero's skills that they've purchased immediately. So if any of our heroes had level two skills, as soon as Whisper moved in there, they would become active. So each tile is broken down into nine different spaces, which are going to be separated by the little lines as well as the walls, which are either going to be considered rooms and chambers or corridors, which are outside of the walls. From here, then each space is either going to be considered a shadow zone or a light zone. In order for a space to be a shadow zone, it must be completely in shadow. And for a space to be considered light space, it must be illuminated in light and have an actual light source to it. So whether it is a torch or different light sources, each space will be illuminated by its own space or its own source of light. So if we look at this tile, for example, we have a light space here and here. This is considered a shadow space, again, because there is no light source in the space, even though there's a little bit of light shining in the side. Then we have the corridor, which is we have a light space here, and then these three spaces here are all considered shadow spaces. Moving over to the side here, we have a light space in, in both of these sections, and again, a shadow zone, as it is, even though it has some light going into it, there is no light source there, so it is considered a shadow space. Let's go ahead and take a look at a breakdown of a hero's card. So at the top of the card is going to be the hero's name, and then the, each hero is going to have a shadow mode skill, which means that if they're in a shadow zone, as you guys already saw, then they can activate that skill and use its ability. So for Owen, it says when he performs an attack action, he may heal one wound. Then each hero is also going to have a special skill, which Owen's is Defender, which states that when he makes a defensive roll, he may re-roll blank results one additional time. And then finally, each hero is going to have a recommended class. For Owen, it is Paladin of Fury, but that doesn't mean you can't experiment and take a different class if you don't want to. Each class is going to list the type of class it is, and it will have all kinds of different abilities that the hero will be able to expend their experience points on to unlock, which we're going to take a look at in a minute. As far as setup is concerned, each hero will receive a dashboard to go along with their hero card. They'll go ahead and get their hero miniature and a color, to, color ring to attach to it. They're also going to receive three tabs to go along with that. One tab will be for the health, which they'll, each hero starts off at five health and each hero will start off with zero experience points. 
The third tab is only used if you're playing a campaign game, which will track micro XP. In campaign games, you will require five micro XP to gain one regular XP. So heroes will acquire uh, XP a lot slower and will be able to buy skills a lot slower as well. But that also means that they will be able to take the skills from one game to another. From there, each hero is also going to receive a standard piece of starting armor and a weapon of their choice from the selection of weapons. And each hero can either equip one, one double-handed weapon or two single-handed weapons. At the start of the game, each hero can only take one weapon, though, whether it's a two-handed weapon or a single-handed weapon. So I'm going to go ahead and take the longsword as it will both give me an attack and a defensive value. And then finally, each hero will also choose which class they're going to be. So we're going to go ahead and take Paladin of Fury. Each class sheet is broken down into the name of the class at the top, and each class will come with a free class skill, which will always be active for the hero, as well as a signature skill, which can only be used once per turn and will cost 1 XP, but these are usually very powerful abilities. Then each class sheet will have a number of skill rows, going down the sheet, as well as the five different levels of each dungeon. Heroes will be able to acquire these skills by spending a number of XP, which is listed in the black box here. And once they spend that, then they can put a check in that the upper box to indicate that they've purchased the skill. And they can purchase the first skill in any row in any order they choose. They just must purchase a skill first in the row before purchasing later skills. And a skill will only be active, active once the hero has reached that level in the dungeon. So for example, with the, in, the enhanced health, if our hero has purchased the first level of that, that skill and then purchased the second level, the second level will not become active until he reaches level 3. And again, these, hero, these skills do not stack. So if our hero has purchased the first level of max health, his health will be increased by 1 point. And when he purchases the second level of the max health and it's reached level three then his max health will be plus two not plus one plus plus two so he will have a max health of seven and this goes true for any skill and like i said you can purchase any skill first in the row in any order so we could buy payback and then come down and buy taunts we don't have to buy it in any particular order Setup for Massive Darkness is very straightforward. First off, the players will choose a scenario that they'd like to play on, and then you can go ahead and set up all the tiles and tokens, the active level token and the non-active level tokens that you're using, the starting zone, and any other tokens that you need on your board. From there, go ahead and shuffle up all of the deck cards that you're going to be using. Normally, you can put out uh, treasure decks 1 through 5 and guard cards 1 through 5 as well. I've chosen for this game to only put out the treasure and guard cards up to level 3 as we won't get any higher than that most likely. Finally, uh, put out the lesser roaming monster cards and the greater roaming monsters. And again, we won't be getting to the greater roaming monsters, so I've only put out those. And then you want to put out your life bringer card with two tokens on it. And that's the number of times you can resurrect your heroes. And then like we talked about earlier, each hero is going to receive a plastic dashboard with the hero of their choice. They're going to put one token on the 5 mark for their life, one token in the XP, and if you're playing a campaign game, then you'll also want to put a token in the micro XP. Each player is also going to receive one leather armor card and their choice of a weapon. And this is a cooperative game, so the players want to work together to choose the best weapons possible for their characters. And then finally, for me, I keep my skill card right underneath my character dashboard so I can reference it nice and easily. And you'll also want to choose one player to be the starting player for this round. From here, we're ready to move into the game. Massive Darkness is a game that is played over an undefined number of rounds until the heroes are either eliminated and defeated or until they meet the objectives that they, that they need for that scenario. Each round is going to be broken into five phases, which are the hero phase, the enemy phase, experience phase, event phase, and finally the end phase. And we're going to go ahead and take a closer look at each one of these phases in detail. The first phase in each round is the hero phase. During this phase, each player is going to activate his hero, starting with the first player and proceeding clockwise. Each hero, when activated, will have three actions to use to do a variety of different things, which we're going to cover in just a second. At the end of the player's turn, if there are any surviving enemies that he has attacked this turn, they are going to also receive a counterattack. 
So let's go ahead and jump in and see what the different actions are that we can perform during our turn. So the first action we're going to look at is to do nothing. With this action, it just means that your hero is either passing on their turn and opting to do nothing with their turn and wasting their actions, or that they've already done a couple of actions and they still have one or more remaining, and they've chosen not to use them for whatever reason. The next one is to get up. So when a hero is stunned, their, their figure is going to be placed face down. During their turn, they must spend their first action to get back up, and then after that, their turn will go as normal where they can spend the rest of their actions to do any other action that they choose. Moving on, the next action we're going to look at is the movement action. So when a hero performs a move action, he's going to receive two movement points that he can spend. Each point can be used to move one space, to open a door, or to pick up treasures and objectives. Any unused move points are lost and a hero cannot perform another action in between his move actions. Heroes and enemies cannot move out of an occupied space, and in order to be able to perform a pickup action, no enemies can be in that space. So let's go ahead and take a look at some examples of this. So we have Bjorn here, and we're going to go ahead and use him for our examples. So in order to... let's go ahead and say that we're going to spend a move action. That will give him two movement points. So he can spend each point to move from his space to an adjacent space in an orthogonal direction. There are no diagonal movements in this game. So each way he's going is in a straight line. So he can use his one movement point to go there, his second movement point to go there. Now, if he wanted to open these doors, he could spend another action to gain movement points. And so he's going to spend one of his movement points to open that door, in which case at that point he would populate that room, which I'm going to cover in a little bit. But let's go ahead and say that there are some treasure in here, and we do have a token up here. So he's going to spend his second movement point to move into the room, and then he's going to spend his third action to gain some more movement points. So he'll move up here for his first, and his second, because this room is clear, there are no enemies in there, he can spend his second movement point to pick up and he will pick up all of the objectives and treasures in that room at one time. So when a hero picks up the treasure in an area, they're going to pick up all the treasure in that area. And they will receive one card per treasure token that they pick up based on the level of that tile, not the current level of the heroes. When they receive their treasure, then they can either uh, equip it immediately, or if there are other heroes in their space, they can freely give those treasure to those heroes. So let's say, for example, that Bjorn moved up to this space and went ahead and grabbed this treasure. Now this is a treasure, this is an advanced treasure, so he's going to receive a treasure one level higher than the level that the treasure is pulled from. So since this is a level one tile, he would receive a level two treasure card. And let's say that he pulled a bow, and Whisper is the one that's using the bow at this point. So he could choose to give her the bow since she's in the same space as him. Now the same thing goes true for enemies. When you defeat an enemy that has a piece of equipment, that, that will go immediately to that hero. Whether that hero is in the same space as the enemy, or whether the hero is across the board shooting at the enemy. So if Whisper was down here, and she was able to kill the dwarf all the way down here with her ranged attack, she would receive the item that that dwarf was holding. And when a hero kills a uh, guardian that has treasure, or an item that they're using, then he can either take it for himself and equip it immediately, or he can again give it to another hero that is in the same space as him. The first time a hero opens a door to a new room, you're going to go ahead and draw a door card and populate that room. So let's go ahead and do that. We're going to have Bjorn open the door, and then we're going to populate the room by drawing a door card. And so the first spot on the card, as you guys can see, says that we're going to spawn a guard card, and we're going to get put two treasure in that area. So then we're going to spawn a guard card based on the level that we're currently in. So we have a level 1 Dwarf Defenders, and they will also draw a level 1 Treasure card to go with them, which is a Fire Sword, so they're going to be able to use that as it is a melee weapon, which makes them even nastier. So then we're going to populate. We have the boss first, and then he's going to be surrounded by a number of minions, which we're going to have one minion per hero that is playing. So we are playing a three-hero game, so we'll place three minions in there, as you guys can see. Then we're going to move to the next room in the chamber, which says that we're not going to place any enemies, and we'll have one advanced treasure. And if this room had a third area, then we would place two more treasure in that area and no enemies. 
But since it does not, then we will not resolve that effect. And if a room had more chambers in it than a guard card has, then you would only populate the first three as well, based on the card you've drawn. Once per round, a hero can also do his signature action. This does not cost an action point, but will require the hero to spend one experience point that they have. So if they do not have any experience, then they will not be able to perform this. And again, like I said, you can only do this once per turn. So let's go ahead and look at an example here. So we have Bjorn here, and he's going to go ahead and spend one experience point to do his signature action, which is to instantly kill one targeted minion. So we have one minion in this space, so he'll spend his experience to kill that minion immediately. With the reorganize and trade action, a hero can reorganize the cards in his inventory, and in the same action, all heroes in the same space may freely exchange any number of cards among themselves. Even killed heroes can participate in this. Any hero involved in the trade action can reorganize their inventory for free. So Bjorn was lucky enough to pick up some new items in that last section where we, were, we saw him pick up treasure. So these are some of the items that he received. And he happens to be in the same space as his other two heroes. So he's going to go ahead and do some trading with them so that they can have some better equipment. As he has some special skills that will benefit him from not having armor, he's not going to go ahead and equip this. So he's going to trade the armor off. So he's going to trade uh, the armor with Whisper, and she's going to go ahead and give her, him her light armor. And he's going to do the same with Owen. Now a trade does not have to be fair, it's just that the players have to agree on it. He's also going to trade the bow so that she can have a better bow, and she's going to go ahead and give him her bow. Now the reason why we're doing this is this will go into the final action that we have which is a transmute which can be done during a trade action and it will not interrupt it so you can do it get some new stuff and then continue trading. So a transmute action will let you discard three equipment cards and draw a treasure card one level higher than that of the lowest card. A hero can reorganize this inventory for free when he does this and a transmute can be done in the middle of a trade action without interrupting the trade. So we're going to go ahead and trade in our three leather, our two leather armors and our short bow. Now these are all level 1 items, so we will receive a level 2 treasure. So we have gotten the Sword of Might, which works out great for Bjorn. So the Sword of Might says that any two-handed equipment is instead considered one hand, and this can be paired. So we're going to go ahead and equip this, and now we're going to have the Sword of Might and the Axe. So he's really going to be pushing out some, some good attack with a red and a yellow. And then this is not, he can give this to somebody else if he wants to, or he can hold on to it. There is no slot for a backpack, so you just hold it off to the side, and each character can hold an unlimited amount of items in their backpack. The last action that you can choose from is a combat action. And with a combat action, there are three different forms of combat. You have melee combat, ranged combat, and magic combat. And I'm going to go ahead and go through a full example of a melee combat, and then I'm just going to give you some details about the ranged magic combat, as they work exactly the same way, they just have some targeting restrictions on them. So first off, we're going to go ahead and say that Bjorn is going to move into this space here and perform an attack against the dwarves. As a melee attack, with most weapons, you must be in the same space as your target to perform that attack. From here, then, we're going to go ahead and gather up all the dice that we need. So Bjorn will receive one red dice, and the dwarf defenders will receive two blue. And we're going to go ahead and give those a roll. All right, so the dwarf defenders and Bjorn have rolled these results. So... First off, the defenders will resolve any BAMs that they have, and they will, must start with any BAMs or abilities enhancements that are listed on their card first. If they are done with those or they don't have any, or they have more BAMs than they can spend on there, as you can only spend one BAM to do each ability one time unless it has a repeat option. Then they can move over to the uh, equipment card that they have equipped. So if if they had a, a sword that helped them out or had a BAM listing, then they could spend it on that. The dwarves do not have anything to spend the BAM on, so then we move over to our hero, who can spend their BAMs on anything that they want as well, which includes any abilities that they have or skills that they've upgraded to. So Bjorn has a Shadowmost skill, which allows him to spend an attack BAM to add one wound to, the, to a combat. 
and he is in a shadow zone, so he can do that. So he'll spend that to do one wound. So with wounds, they're, instead of being swords, they're going to just do a straight damage to the enemy. And he's always going to target minions first. You must target minions before you go after the boss. He will be the last one to be attacked unless you that, that enemy group is stunned, in which case then you can go after the boss first. So we're going to go ahead and eliminate one minion with that wounds that he did with the shadow mode. And then we're going to resolve the swords and shields that they have. So Bjorn rolled two swords and the dwarves rolled two shields, so they're going to cancel each other out. But let's go ahead and say, just for example, that the dwarves had only rolled one shield. He would do one additional damage, and again, he must target minions first. And the minions only have one health, so he would have eliminated another minion. So the second example of this I want to look at real quick is we're going to go ahead and say that our character has moved up a little bit and was able to get some additional weapons. So we're going to go ahead and look at that he's dual wielding a long sword and a battle axe from level 3. Each of these weapons is going to grant him a yellow and a red dice. So he'll be throwing two yellow and two red. And again, the maximum number of dice that a hero can throw is three of one color. So if something would have given him four yellow, the most he can throw is three. And he can do this of each color. So if he had something that gave him three red and three yellow, he could throw all those. And the same goes for defense. If an enemy has uh, defense, they can only throw three of each color dice. So then we're going to go ahead and say that the dwarves are throwing a little bit better as well. They're going to get a green and two blue. We're going to go ahead and give these a roll. All right, so Bjorn did okay with his results, and the enemy didn't do so good. They only rolled a couple, and they rolled one blank, which the dwarf defenders do have a special ability. They can re-roll any blanks one time, and so they picked up another shield. Again, the, the defenders are first to spend any bams or diamonds that they roll, which our dwarves didn't roll any diamonds or bams, and then our hero will spend his. So he rolled two bams. So first off, go through and make sure that you have any skills that you have that you can use are used. So for example, let's say that uh, Bjorn here had sustains damage and he has no armor equipped. Then when he performs an attack, he would receive one additional sword result. And make sure, again, that you only have skills that you're using up to the level that you are. So right now with us being in level one, we can only use level one skills that our characters have purchased. From here, then, again, he'll spend that one bam to do one damage with the shadow mode skill. And so he would take out another minion. And then we were going to compare results. So let's go ahead and remove three swords for the three shields. And so Bjorn has done three damage left. He would kill one dwarf minion. And the rest of the swords are wasted, as you can never take additional damage to the boss from an attack. You must attack the boss specifically, and you can only do that when all the minions are dead. So at this point, if Bjorn had another attack, he could go ahead and attack the dwarf back. The final part of a hero's turn is the counterattack. So any enemies that a hero attacks during his activation, whether wounded or not, in which are still alive after he completes his actions, will try to counterattack that hero. The enemy is going to be activated just like he will in the enemy's turn, which I'm going to show you guys in a couple minutes. And the only exception to this is that the enemy is only going to target the hero that attacked them. So if they cannot attack that hero or cannot reach that hero, then they will not attack any hero. And if a hero is out of line of sight of the enemy he attacked and in the shadow zone, then the enemy will not be activated in the counterattack. So let's look at a couple examples of this. So first off, we have Bjorn here, and he attacked the uh, group of dwarf defenders. And so the boss is the only one left, and he has used all of his actions. So at this point, the boss is going to go ahead and counterattack Bjorn. But let's go ahead and say, for example, that Whisper was here, and she was using her bow. And she happened to miss and didn't do any damage during her activation. But now it's at the end of her turn where the dwarves are going to counterattack. Since the dwarves are melee users and they do not have any ranged or magic attacks, then they will not be able to attack Whisper because they're not in the same space and they cannot move out of this space since Bjorn is in there. So in that situation, then they will simply do nothing. 
But let's go ahead and say, for example, one more thing. Let's go ahead and say that Bjorn had a weapon that allowed him to stun the dwarves. So the dwarves are stunned. At that point, he can move out of that zone. And if he was in a shadow space that was not in line of sight of the dwarves, at the end of his turn, when the, dwar the dwarves would not activate to do their counterattack, and so they would remain stunned during their activation in the enemy's turn. All right, so let's go ahead and talk about the other two types of attacks, which are the, the uh, ranged attack and the magic attack. So first off, with the ranged attack... With ranged weapons, you can never target anything in your space, but you can target anything in a straight line as far as you can see. So if the board kept going, uh, Whisper here could target all the way down the sh as far as she could see. Again, everything is done orthogonal or in straight lines. There is no diagonal line of sight. So as long as she can see it all the way down, then she can target it. And it doesn't matter if it's in a shadow space or in a light space. And the same goes true for magic. Magic cannot target anything in its space, and of course there are some items that will negate these rules, um, so just pay attention to that. But uh, magic attacks cannot target anything in their own space, but and they can only target models up to two spaces away. So magic has a little bit of a limitation as far as its range is concerned, because it's not quite as powerful as a ranged attack um, in as far as distance is concerned. So only one to two spaces of, ahead of the your model is where you can target. And again, it doesn't matter if it's in a shadow space or a light space, as long as it's in a straight line. Once all the heroes have been activated and have completed their actions, we're ready to move into the enemy phase. So during the enemy phase, you're going to activate each agent, roaming monster, and mob on the board, and you can activate them in whichever order the players decide. Each enemy is going to go through a number of steps in their activation. And we're going to go ahead and go through these steps first, and then I'm going to take a look at some examples with you. So step one is that enemies will attempt to attack heroes if there are any heroes in line of sight and within range of any of their highlighted attack actions. If there are multiple heroes enemy could target, it will attack the hero among those who has the highest amount of unspent XP, if ties and the players are going to choose. If an enemy performs an attack, their turn is over. If not, then you're going to move on to step two, which is to move. The enemy, is going, if is unable to attack, it will move one zone towards its target. Move to get into range of a hero in line of sight and with the most unspent XP. Moves towards the hero on the board in, in a light zone with the most XP if it cannot see any heroes or, or if there's no heroes in line of sight. And if no target, it will move towards the starting zone. So if all the heroes are in shadow zones and they are not in line of sight of, the, of this enemy, then he's just going to move towards the starting zone. And enemies cannot leave a zone if there is a hero in it. And enemies will always follow the shortest path to their target. After you complete their move action, then they're going to continue their activation by trying to attack, just like in the first step. And if they could not attack, they will move one more zone, like in step two. After this second move, the enemy does not attack and its activation will end. All right, so let's take a look at some examples of this. So we have the dwarf defenders here, and they have two different heroes to choose from, and the dwarf defenders only have melee combat. So then we're going to look at our heroes and see which one has the most experience points. So Bjorn has 10, where Ellis only has 3, so the dwarf defenders are going to target Bjorn. Once they perform their attack, then their turn is over. Moving on to our goblin archers, they have a couple of choices, and they have a couple of attack types. They are both uh, melee combat, uh, combatants, and they have a ranged ability with their bows. So they have a couple of heroes they can choose from. They have Whisper that's in their space, or Owen. So again, when they an enemy has a choice, you're going to refer to the heroes, and the hero that has the most un unspent XP will be the target. So Whisper only has 2 XP, where Owen has 5, so the goblins are going to use their ranged attacks to target Owen. Now, if they did not have a ranged ability, even though Owen and Whisper, they can see them, they could not choose to move out of this space to go after Owen, since Whisper is in there. All, and an enemy can never move out of a space that has a hero in it. And then finally, we have the High Troll down here. And again, he's going to move towards a hero that he can see, which right now he has no line of sight to any of the heroes. So then he's going to move towards the hero 
that has the most unspent XP in a light space. So Whisper is the only hero that is in a light space now, so our troll is going to move one space towards her. Again, then he would perform an attack if he had range to any of our heroes, which he does not. So then he's going to move one last time. And so again, he's going to move towards the hero that he can see or the hero that is in a light zone. So again, he would move in this direction. And let's go ahead and say that Whisper was here instead. He would still move in this direction as he's going to move towards the start zone then, even though all of our heroes are in shadow spaces. So in this way, you can all, you can kind of get enemies to go in the direction you want them to go, as long as all your heroes are hidden in an, and out of line of sight of your enemies. At this point, uh, he has performed his second move action, so even if at this point he was in a space with a hero or could see a hero and perform a ranged attack on them, he could not as his activation is over at that point. Once you've completed activating all the enemies, then the enemy phase is going to come to an end and we're ready to move into the next phase, which is the experience phase. During this phase, the hero players are going to be able to spend any acquired experience points that they have to purchase new skills and abilities on their skill tree. They must have the amount of points that is listed for each the skill that they wish to purchase, and they must purchase the first skill in a category before purchasing later skills in that category. So with Bjorn here, we could spend five experience points to unlock his charge ability, or sustain damage is another really good one to have for him. And then from there, once all the players are done, then they will move on to the next phase. And you can purchase as many skills as you want to based on the amount of points that you have. Just deduct the amount of points for each skill that you purchase. The fourth phase in a round is the event phase. And during this phase, the player that has the first player marker is going to go ahead and draw one event card and read it out loud. So we're going to go ahead and do that. We have the forward monster patrol, and this says that if there are already roaming monsters in play, you're going to activate one of them. If not, spawn a roaming monster card. Place the enemy in a zone with the token of the current level plus one. If the current level is the highest level, then you're going to place it in that level. So with us, we're going to go ahead and draw a roaming monster, which is the High Troll. And he's also going to receive a treasure of the current level. So he'll receive a level 1 treasure as we're still level 1. And so he received a Javelin, which isn't going to help him as it is a ranged weapon. And his highlighted areas are the melee and defense. And then we're going to place him one level higher than our level, so he'll be placed in the, the area with the level 2 token. Now the one exception to this is when spawning, if there are not enough of the corresponding enemy model, then you're going to ignore it and discard the enemy card and activate any enemies on the board that have the matching type as the card that was drawn. Once you've completed this, then you're ready to move into the final phase of the round, which is the end phase. This is going to mark the end of the game round, and many of the effects that last until the end phase are going to end at this point, and they can be done in any way the players choose. The first player token is finally going to be passed to the next player to the left, and then you're ready to start a new round. Well, I hope you guys found this video helpful. As always, if you have any questions or comments, please leave those in the comment section below and I'll do my best to answer them. And thank you guys so much for continuing to watch my videos. I do appreciate all the support and feedback that you guys have given me. And as always, please consider hitting that like button and subscribing to my channel as it will help me to continue to grow and continue to bring new and exciting games to you guys. And if you guys want to swing by the Facebook and Twitter accounts that I have as well, please leave me some comments there. Or let me know what you guys are doing, if this is a game that you guys have played or have picked up, or how your guys' games are going, or games that you guys think I should be covering. Please leave those in the comments below, or hit me up on one of my other accounts and let me know there. And as always, I will see you guys later.